that would mean that we won't be around. That would mean the death of us. And, and that's really not acceptable for us. We cannot survive with that kind of um, temperature rise. For people who don't understand climate change, which is probably most people in the United States, why wouldn't you be around? What would happen? Uh, sea levels will rise. We are just 1.5 meters above the water. And if we have uh, sea levels rising um, to uh, 70, 80 centimeters, that's going to eat up most of our country. Um, so we won't be around. Are you making preparations for a mass population removal to uh, dry land? Well, you know, we've been there in the middle of the Indian Ocean for the last 10,000 years, and we have a written history that goes back 2,000 years. I can move, but where would all the butterflies go, all the sounds go, all the culture go, all the color go? Um, I don't think it really is a feasible option to move. It's going to be almost impossible for us to convince our people to move. That is the Maldivian president, yeah. Mohammed Nasheed. Yeah, that's exactly the problem. Uh, and that's what was happening in Copenhagen. The wealthy countries are trying to basically buy off these countries that will, in effect, disappear. It doesn't make sense. I mean, and the danger is that these countries will see this money. That's why the United States offered uh, to to uh, promote a hundred billion dollars per year, which is which is um, imaginary money because I don't think that's going to happen. The United States share of that, based on our contribution to the carbon in the atmosphere, would be 27 percent, 27 billion per year. Do you think that our Congress is going to vote 27 billion? per year to give these poor countries. It's not going to happen. What we, and it's, but that's the danger that these poor countries will say, gee, that's a lot of money. Maybe we can get that. What we actually have to do is solve the problem, not pay people off. And that requires uh, reducing the carbon emissions. Let me ask you about the East Anglia controversy, the University of East Anglia, that the um, climate deniers, the climate change deniers are using. Um, explain what happened, actually, the discussion between the scientists, what is being called climate gate, in emails that hackers got a hold of, and how it's being used. Yeah, well, obviously, this discussion between some of the clients climate scientists revealed frustrations that they have with the contrarians who continually will nitpick about is this station data good or is that one not and what they should have done is release their full data immediately because the, there's no question about uh, the actual climate change and um, by by having by this attempts to not be completely open, they open themselves up to criticism. But in fact, the climate uh, record is is uh, not debated, and it's not debatable. If if they give all the data, then they give the opportunity to somebody else to show, oh, this is really not warming. But of course, they can't show that because the evidence is all over the place that the climate really is changing. So, but unfortunately, this episode has been very confusing to the public. So now there are many in the United States, especially, who are skeptical about whether the climate change is real. So it's been a public relations disaster, but it doesn't change the science one iota. In fact, uh, the science has become clearer and clearer over the last several years. Mm. Um, can you talk about where the United States is versus Europe? I talked to people throughout Europe in Copenhagen. I mean, thousands of people came out. Whether you wanted those talks to collapse or not, the level of networking and of groups all over the world was truly remarkable that took place there, largely outside yeah. of the yeah. Bella Center, but also inside, because uh, in the last few days, civil society was really kept out of those talks. Um, but they said the United States is years behind in just the discourse, because we're at yeah. the point of, if you even have a discussion in the U.S. media, it's about whether global warming exists. Yeah. Whereas in Europe, it's about the debates are about, well, what do we do? I yeah. mean, carbon sequestration, should there be cap and trade? What are the alternatives? That's where the debates lie there. Here, we're way behind. Yeah. And for a very good reason, uh, because of the effectiveness of the industries that don't want to see change. They have had an enormous impact on the public's perception of 
the issue. Where do you see that with scientists, for example? We just did that piece on health care, the amount of money they're pouring in lobbying on health care. What is it in um, on global warming legislation that didn't pass the Senate, $300,000 a day from coal, oil, gas? Well, yeah, there are more than 2,500 uh, energy lobbyists in Washington. So that's more than four per congressperson. And that's, uh, unfortunately, the public just doesn't have that kind of representation. And th it's also a, 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 a fact that the industry influences the um, the media, so that you always see this presented as if it's an either uh, there's one side and there's another side, as if they were equal. But in fact, the science has become crystal clear, and we have the most authoritative scientific body in the world in the National Academy of Sciences. So all the president would need to do, if he wants to make this issue clear to the public, is ask the academy to give him a clear report on this subject. And the answer would be very clear. The effect of the EPA now announcing that um, carbon, methane, that they are threats to public health, can the EPA just start regulating regardless of uh, Congress passing legislation? Well, they can. But then, when we have a new election and a different party comes to power, that their ability to do that might be changed. And so that's why it's preferable to have laws uh, written by Congress and signed by the president. But um, in the absence of that, EPA can get us moving in the right direction. And they are beginning to do that, for example, in vehicle efficiencies. Mm -hmm. um, talk about the level of suppression of science in the United States. You personally experienced it. There was this expose in The Times where you first were talking to Andrew Rethkin and explaining what was happening under the Bush administration, and even before that, the suppression of your work when you testified before Congress to what Senator Al Gore at the time. Yeah. It's, there, there are two major problems. One is that the public affairs offices of the science agencies are headed by political appointees, and they tend to try to control the information that goes from the science agencies to the public, if it is a politically sensitive topic. In many topics, maybe 99 percent, there's no interference. But when it becomes a sensitive issue, as uh, it was uh, with global warming, um, there there is that tendency. So the solution to that would be to have professionals, career civil servants, head the public affairs offices. Otherwise, they are offices of propaganda. And it's still—it doesn't matter which—whether it's Democrats or Republicans, as soon as there's an election, a change of uh, party in power, they replace the heads of these offices. So they're still offices of propaganda, in my opinion. The other thing is, is a, if a government scientist testifies to Congress, he has to first show his testimony to the White House. Doesn't make sense. Why should Congress not get the best opinion of the scientists? This is a is a power which is just taken by the executive branch, and Congress has not objected to it. Again, it doesn't make sense because the scientific the scientists are paid by the public. Uh, they're so they shouldn't uh, be under the control of the White House. They should be free to give the best uh, scientific advice they can. Um, you had a young man, 24 years old, named George Deutsch, uh, put in charge of you as the top scientist over at NASA, Goddard Institute for Space Studies, under the Bush administration. Um, turned out he hadn't graduated from college, whatever. He was determining who you got to talk to in the media, what information you were putting out. He was— Well, that's the way the story came out in The New York Times. And it sounded as if this low-level person was responsible for the censorship. He was reporting to the highest level. Mm -hmm. At, um, at NASA headquarters, the, the head of the public affairs office. So, in fact, um, it, this was the problem I just described. It's the fact that the administration in power feels that it gets to control the information that goes to the public. It doesn't make sense in a democracy. A democracy doesn't work right if the public cannot be honestly informed. Uh, do you feel your work is being suppressed now? You still work with no, NASA? Uh, no, I don't feel that it's being suppressed now. Uh, but 
the prob the fundamental problem has not been solved in that the the heads of these um, offices are still political appointees but I've been ever ever since this uh, issue be, became open uh, during the administration I've been allowed to say what I want because I think the p bad publicity of um, of any censorship is is not worth it, so they're not trying to control what I say. And you were reporting to the top people. It was not only the top people controlling what you had to say. You were meeting with Dick Cheney, the vice president. You were meeting with Colin Powell to warn them about global warming. What was their response? Well, yeah, I had the opportunity at the beginning of the Bush administration to speak to the um, Energy Climate Task Force, which was headed by Vice President Cheney and which had six cabinet members plus the EPA administrator and the National Security Advisor on it. But what I learned was—and and we, I think, gave them a clear story about the dangers in um, continuing greenhouse gas emissions.